And another good evening. It is September the 3rd, 2011. We've made it this long. We've got six days until the big 911 extravaganza. Wonder what uh, what our government's got in store for us as far as a false flag on this grandiose anniversary uh, of 9/11. <coughs> we know something's coming. We just don't know exactly what. So something will be in the mix, I'm sure, if not before. Also, I've, already, I've already heard what's going to happen. Oh, have you? I hope you're going to be man enough to share it with us. Obama said he's going to resign. <laughs> uh, Gene, if you're on the line there, hit star six on your keypad on your um, telephone. I'm here. Hi, Gene. Welcome to the show. Where's That's the here? one only. How you doing tonight? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm elated. We're uh, we got the state of Nevada to file. I sent the state of Nevada a copy of the bill in equity, and they filed suit against Bank of America. They're going to shut them down. Yeah, I understand that was actually your paperwork that that did that, right? Yeah, they filed it August 30th, 2011. Okay. We filed the complaint uh, a, a month and about a month and a half ago, and we're, all of them are following suit. The, uh, the uh, AIG just uh-huh. filed against the they're suing the investors, or I mean Bank of Excuse me, Bank of America for the investors. This is another Enron scandal. You got to understand. I knew what was going on 20 years ago. You know, you there's a there's a group. Of, go ahead. The Enron complaint that was that was filed in the Enron case. Uh huh. William Davies and Helen Hodges are the two lead attorneys for the investors that sued Enron. Enron was disguising mortgage loans as investment contracts. The banks are disguising investment contracts as mortgage loans. You got to understand what's going on here. That's not my opinion. I'm actually proving it. I'm giving them the evidence that that's what's going on. It's unassailable. Gene, are you familiar with uh, with Richard Fine? I know who he is, yeah. He's got a big lawsuit, uh, racketeering, the judicial racketeering down in the L.A. area going after Rico. Um, he's got quite a oh, video yeah. out. This is money laundering, racketeering, yep. but you've got to go after them in equity. You can't do it in law. People don't understand equity. I've been brainstorming. I've got uh, f- five of the greatest authorities in the world. I got Austin Scott. I located uh, uh, his brand new 2011 rendition of trust law. I bought it from Aspen. It cost me $2,800. It's the only set that, that you, I mean, you can't, this is like filing, finding a diamond. Austin is considered the greatest authority in the world on trust. Gene, you're gonna you're gonna have to bear with us a little bit because uh, as guest twenty five here says, please explain equity to us dummies. <laughs> What's the difference between equity? Use a kindergarten uh, vocabulary. Okay, the difference between law and equity very simple. All law is colorable, fiction. Why? Because there's no money. They look at form and character. When you bring an action under form and characteristic, you waive equity. It extinguishes equity because the court can't look at at substance when you do that. Remember, one of the maxims of equity, equity looks at substance, not form. It looks at intent, nature, and... and, uh, Intent, nature and intent of the litigant. Number two, equity recognizes beneficiaries, which means that when you go in there at law, on the law side of the court, which is the public side, you cannot bring up trust law because if they don't recognize a beneficiary, they don't recognize trust, trust law. Number two, Therefore, you're dead before you ever get started. We're shutting them down. We sh- we've shut 20 of them down, every single one of them, without fail. Now, you do that through the paperwork? Yeah, through the paperwork. We do it. We're not, we're not even – we're in court. When you, when you do a bill in equity, 
We're not. A court is a place. Everybody has a mistaken notion about what a court is. A court is a place where a contract is made. Okay. It's not a. It's not all of these buildings that you call courts are privately owned trading companies. They have a DUNS number. They have a a sick code, pick code, cage code. They're commercial trading companies. They're not courts. We're doing this outside what you call the courtroom. We're convening a court in equity by filing a bill in equity, and they're recognizing it. I got a call from the head legal counsel of the Federal Reserve, and she's treating our bill in equity as a complaint. And are we getting results? You can't believe the, sh- the shit. That's- you got to read some of the letters I'm getting. I'm getting letters from the OCC, Office of Comp Controller of Currency, from the B- Federal Reserve Board is sending me letters. They're not sending me the letters. They're sending my clients the letters. Okay. Um, now, you have clients we underneath. Got there. When you hit somebody alongside the head with a baseball bat, you got their attention. <laughs> Believe me. How can, uh, is there any way people can get... When you go into equity, if you study what equity is, this is what they they did under the King's Bench in in 1066. They they had a a room. The king had a room where he convened court. They called it the Regis Room, R-E-G-I-S. And then what he did is he appointed, because he got overwhelmed, Because a a court of equity is a court of consciousness. And substance, it it takes takes priority over form. Equity looks at substance, not form. When you go into, and this has been going on for thousands of years, it's not just after 1933, common law doesn't give you a remedy. Equity does. Like, if you're going to be an injured party, equity will give you a a temporary restraining order before you're injured. If you go in at law, you have to be injured, and then you can get your TRO. But equity prevents the injury before it happens. That's the difference. And equity works on substance. Equity, all of these cases involve a constructive trust in equity, which means that as soon as the act was committed, by actual constructive fraud, a constructive trust was created by operation of law. That means that an, an equitable lien was established, and legal and beneficial equitable title were merged together when this happened, because equity does what should have been done in the first instance. So as soon as they did the act, The trust was created, the constructive trust. They all became constructive trustees, or what they call trustees de sontorrent, because of fraud. So what happens is titles are merged, a lien is created. You've already won your case if you go into equity. That's how powerful this is. And what they, they don't even teach this to lawyers in law school. And the Bar Association has managed to hide this from the general public. Um, you, Gene, do you, you have any hide. case? Do you have any case numbers or case where any of this can be looked up for verification and validation? Oh, hell yes, I do. I have. I have a. Uh, <laughs> Equity is very. Go listen to Christian Walters. He knows what he's talking about. He's absolutely correct. The only thing is that that, uh, taxes are statutory equity, and it's who owes the taxes, and people don't understand tax law. Taxes are interest on principal. When the tax return or the interest is returned back to the principal, you have settlement and closure. And since you're dealing in gift, you're dealing in a state law, until there's an agreement between the beneficiaries and the trustees as to what taxes are owed, and that's what my complaint does. It creates an agreement between the trustees and the beneficiaries as to what taxes are owed. 
if you don't come in there as the executor or the beneficiary, executor and beneficiary of the estate, then you're not you don't have standing to come into court. Because when you come in there as a beneficiary, you're expressing trust, which is what Kristen Walters teaches. And he's absolutely correct. If you bring up the fact that you're a beneficiary, like I go in there and tell them that I'm I'm a, a, a beneficiary of the preamble and a constituent member of the posterity under the constitutional trust. The Constitution is an express trust. And since I'm the beneficiary of that trust and the people that created and uh, I'm also the... Uh, the grantor settlers created the trust, and I became the beneficiary and heir to that trust. So the judges of these courts of equity have an oath to uphold that constitutional trust. If they don't, they're in breach of fiduciary duty. So they have a, a they have a duty, a fiduciary trustee duty, to uphold the rights and remedies of the beneficiary of that trust. And that's what I use in my bill in equity. Gene, we got a question here for you. Um, it says, uh, who, is the, who, should, um, who is the posterity? Those were all, uh, those were the people that were the original members, constituent members of the, uh, if you will, the colonies. When they adopted and ratified the constitution, they were supposed to expound on the uh <clears throat> they they were they were going to just they were going to uh, they were just going to alter the articles of confederation and perpetual union they weren't going to change them but what they did is they extinguished them now you're under the constitution but the constitution was a trust the original constitution the, if you want to get into the racial aspect of it, it's the white races. Why do you think they call the White House the White House? You know, I'm going to have you take off on that one. Uh, Ed uh, from the clan of chat, and him and him and I are in agreement. We go off on this about every call we have, and we're accused of being racist and everything else. But if you take the letter of the law of the Constitution as that's I how understand they get around, it, That's how they get, the, get around the truth is by calling you a racist. They, they bring up this, uh, you're anti-Semitic. The word uh, Semitic comes from Shem, which means Semitic. Those are all white people. So what, so what they're doing is accusing you. When they say that you're a racist, they're saying that you're being Semitic. Because people don't know what the word Semitic means. Shem, who was Semitic, was white. The three sons of Noah were all white. Okay. So what they're saying is that you're anti-white. Wow, this is going to be a little bit to get my head wrapped around because I, I know, like I said, uh, well, go look up the 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 etymology of the word uh, Semitic. It comes from Shem, and Shem was white. It's uh, you read yes. Solomon's uh, Songs of Solomon. Uh, it says, "My beloved was white and ruddy complected." And he's referring to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ was white and ruddy complected. What does uh, that tell you? One of our guests here uh, said the original people were French Moroccan. He goes on to say French Moroccan slash American Indians. Yeah, that's correct. The Cherokees, the the original confederacy was the Iroquois League, which is a seven-nation confederation. They had the Senecas, the Choctaws, the Mohicans, the Iroquois, the Cherokees, who were all Scot-Irish, formed the, the original seven-nation confederation called the Iroquois League. That expounded into, that was the predecessor for the Ten Nation Confederation under the Articles of Confederation. They were all Indian tribes. Most of the plantations in the South were owned by Cherokee chiefs who were all Scot-Irish. And they came from the highlands of Scotland originally. And for 300 years, nobody would fight them because when they went into battle, they fought to the death. Okay. Well, study the histories of the Cherokee Indians. Since I'm a uh, full-blooded Cherokee, I can I can vouch for that. I spent six years fighting in the ring, so I'll, I can vouch for that. <laughs>